Morning, everyone. Morning. It's really great to see so many people here. Um, good morning. My name is Grant Campbell. I'm a partner here at Brodie's, and I head up our information law practice. Um, welcome to our regular data protection update. Uh, for those of you who are vigilant, you will see that there are two names on the front slide. Unfortunately, Martin Sloan has gone down with a largy overnight. So unfortunately, for the next 45 or 50 minutes or so, you'll be listening to me. But I do hope that you will get something out of this session. Um, you'll also notice that for the first time in a long time, the headline is not just GDPR. So this is a more general data protection law update covering all of the things that we've seen happen since June. And June's not that far back. Uh, but what has happened? Well, Dixon's car phone affected by data breach affecting 10 million folk. Outcome yet uh, to be determined. Uh, BT fine for sending millions of spam emails to raise money for charity. Um, in Europe, quite a lot of disagreement about whether the US EU privacy shield is working. Quite a lot of unhappiness with the American attitude to it. Facebook facing a half million pound fine from the UK Data Protection Watchdog. Uh, Martin put this one in. He's a real um, fan of the Yes Minister stuff. Uh, but actually, we're looking, you know, this episode goes back to about 1980, and there's a whole load of really, you know, quite pertinent stuff going on in relation to exactly the same issues as we're dealing with now. Um, and this was a Canadian firm, Aggregate IQ hit with the first ever enforcement notice under, under, under GDPR. And then there's Brexit lurking in the background as well. These are all things that have just happened since June, since the last update. So a lot going on. So what am I going to cover? I'm going to talk about five months in from GDPR, what is it we're seeing? Um, those of you who have been monitoring the press the last couple of days, see there have been developments in the Morrison's case. Um, I'll talk a bit about that. I'll offer up some observations about personal data breach reporting. Uh, joint controllership is something that we are seeing coming up more often. Uh, I'll talk about why. I'll go back to some of the cases that happened during the summer and explain a little bit about how we think that's playing out. I mentioned no deal in Brexit. What is that going to mean? And then for those of you who come to these sessions regularly, I'll talk a little bit about the ICO's enforcement, some of the, some of the decisions that have been made, uh, and the data security trends. And then finally, there's more stuff on the horizon, so I'll give you a kind of an idea as to what we think is coming. So hot topics in the first five months. Well, what are we seeing? I think a lot of organizations have dilemmas about things going wrong in the organization in terms of breaches, whether or not to report. Uh, I'll talk again a little bit about that in more detail uh, shortly. Who's what? Who is a controller? Who is a processor? Are we joint controllers? Are we controllers in common? Does it matter? Um, I think one of the lessons always is that you know, when you're dealing with suppliers, they are not always processors. It really is fact dependent on what they're doing with data. A lot of interest and a lot of um, discussion around data sharing and partnership arrangements. Um, what is the legal basis for the data sharing? Can you rely on the other party's legal basis? If somebody comes to you and say, I want you to share data with me because I've got a very good reason for sharing data, can you rely on that person's, um, th that person's uh, justification? Particularly if the person who's seeking the data is a public body and may have some statutory function that they're looking to, they're looking to use, can you piggyback on their justifications? Still quite a lot of toing and froing about contracts between controllers and processors. I was talking with some members of the audience just before I came in, you know, issues around things like liability. You know, there's a lot still happening there in terms of market norms coming out. You know, for suppliers, is it the value of the contract that's important? For the, for the customer, it's very much how much processing are you doing? How likely it is that you can cause a big, you know, a big loss for us? So a lot still happening. And 
do we really need consent? Now, this is a very busy slide, I think, the next one. Uh, but we tried to, and when you get the handout, you'll be able to perhaps spend a bit more time looking at this. But what we tried to do here for, for the benefit of, of everyone is just try and distill into one slide as best we can. We do apologize for the asterisks and the footnotes uh, to try and explain when consent is likely to be required for, for marketing activity in the, depending on the various channels that you're using. Uh, I, think the, I think the main things, and I, we said this, I think, at the last session, you know, whether or not people needed to go and repaper all their consent uh, for the purposes of the 25th of May really depended on where they were in terms of how they had compiled their database and on what basis they were using it. Um, you know, soft opt-in is still there. It is available for commercial organizations, for existing customers, but not, for example, for the likes of charities and political parties. So it's quite a complicated landscape. And this, this chart attempts, and I'll leave you to, to look at it at your leisure. We can talk about it next time. But this chart attempts to give answers to the particular different um, uh, alternatives that, that you may come across. So, Morrison's and vicarious liability. Um, Martin talked about the Morrison's decision a little bit um, at the last session because we had the, the original decision. This week we've just had the Court of Appeals decision. So for those of you who haven't been following it, um, Morrison's, the supermarket, was the subject of a data breach by a rogue employee. Now, what that employee did was criminal conduct. He has been... I think it's a he has been sentenced to eight years imprisonment for what he did. Effectively, took the data of 100,000 employees and, and published it. 5,000 of those employees have brought an action against Morrison's. Now, at High Court, the High Court held that Morrison's were not directly liable under the DPA for the Individuals Act, and I think this is quite important, that actually Morrison's had pretty much done, had met the standards that were required by the DPA, the Security Standard Principle 7 as it was, in terms of taking appropriate measures to protect the data. But even though they hadn't breached the DPA, they were still vicariously liable for the actions of that employee. And at the time, I think first time round when we got this, it made a lot of data protection practitioners' eyes open because you kind of think if you haven't breached the DPA, then actually you should, as a controller, think that you are not responsible. But actually the court's decision was, well, you are vicariously liable for the actions of that employee. So Morrison's appealed that to the, to the Court of Appeal. The judgment was issued earlier this week. And the decision was to uphold the High Court's decision. Now, I think one of the things that's important to understand here is that a lot of the arguments around this were on, based on common law duties as an employer. So the duty of confidentiality, the duty to prevent misuse of private information. But having established that the, the employer was responsible for these things, so for confidentiality and preventing misuse of private information, those duties are not excluded by the DPA, so the DPA does not overwrite them. So the fact that you have complied with the DPA does not mean that you cannot be held responsible for failure to keep the information confidential, failure to prevent misuse of personal information, and because that person did what he did when he was an employee, the courts felt that it was right that Morrison's should be responsible um, even though it had complied with its obligations under the DPA. Now, what is clear from the judgment is, you know, when you think about it from the controller's perspective and the basic argument, this isn't fair, we did what we were supposed to do. How can we protect against the action, criminal actions of one of our employees? Courts, Court of Appeals certainly said the answer to this lies in insurance. You should insure against this. Now, that's, that's quite an interesting, an interesting take. Now, so I don't think there was any argument about whether or not Morrison's had complied with the DPA. The ICO took no enforcement action. I think Morrison's had complied. But there is this separate stream um, around employment in terms of the duties of an employee, employer 
and whether or not those give grounds for an action against, against a data controller because of what happened. Uh, Court of Appeal has refused leave for Morrisons to appeal, but Morrisons have, have sought leave directly from the House of Lords, so this case may yet have legs to run. What can you do to mitigate those risks if you are an employer or controller? I guess the answer is not much. You know, Morrisons, I think, had met the standards required by the DPA, but again, I think what you have to do is you have to go back and you have to look at all of the internal processes you have, your access controls, the systems you have to monitor or prevent data leakage, your breach response procedures, uh, staff vetting. These are all very, all very obvious things to say after the event, but actually tightening controls still further to prevent these things happening has got to be the best way to, to avoid this sort of liability. And then looking at insurance. Now, insurance is an evolving market for, for, for data breaches. We've seen a lot of clients relying on insurance. And one of the things I, I would say is, if you are relying on insurance, particularly if you're taking contractual liability in some of the processing contracts, and you're relying on insurance to back that off, I think you really need to, to be talking to your insurers and your brokers to make sure they understand what the extent of that liability is so that you can feel confident that it will respond to a claim. Because often what you find is, or you can find, is you're relying on insurance to meet that liability, but actually the small print of the insurance means that it doesn't respond and then you have an uninsured liability, which could be quite substantial in the context of this sort of area. I suppose the other issue which I'll just leave, leave as a thought hanging is, you know, who is responsible for the rogue employee of a processor? Does this mean that it actually all goes back up to the controller? I don't know. So, personal data breach reporting. Any personal data breach is not... Uh, not Personal data breach is not any breach of GDPR of the 2018 Act. So the European Data Protection Board identifies three types of data breach. And I think it's important just to, to remember this. The one that everybody always thinks about is the confidentiality breach. So where there is unauthorised or accidental disclosure of data, that's the most obvious one. Availability breach is less obvious, but it is a breach. So where there is an accidental or unauthorized loss of access to data. So the most obvious example would be some sort of ransomware that holds your data to, to, to ransom, but that is also potentially a breach. So is an integrity breach where someone can come in on an unauthorized or accidental basis and alter data. So all of these things are potentially, are potentially breaches. Not all personal data breaches are notifiable. So the obligation is to notify within 72 hours unless the breach is unlikely to result in a risk to the data subject. I think starting point is you think you've got a breach unless you conclude there is no risk to the individual. And then, of course, there is the, the, the consideration as to whether you need to notify the individual um, and you inform them if that is likely to result in a high risk to the data subject. And we've produced a handy guide that you can access through that link. It talks about this in more detail. The ICO has said um, in the last month or two that actually there is over-reporting of breaches, so they are having reports of things that they do not consider actually were reportable. And I think the figures that I saw quoted, the ICO in um, the UK ICO was saying that they were getting in September or August, September, about 500 calls a week, and of those 500 calls, they thought about a third related to events that were not actually reportable breaches. Now, I think that's actually pretty understandable. I think, you know, we will get to a point where we, we all recognise what a reportable breach is. I think the ICO will, will get issue guidance as to what they think is or is not a reportable breach. But at the moment, I think people are being very cautious and thinking we're not going to take a risk. If we believe that we've got a breach that we think might be reportable, we will report it because we shouldn't be criticised for, for doing that. Um, how do you assess the risk? Well, a lot of these things, and particularly you know, in, in the short time frame that you may have in which to report, a lot of these things are 
you know, they are shades of grey rather than complete black and white. You often get, you sometimes get breaches that are absolutely black and white. You know that they are reportable, but often you get ones where, you know, the various factors pointing in different directions. So, you know, you have to think about the, the type of breach. So unauthorised access, or is it accidental loss of data? Depending on what it is, the consequences may actually be, may be different. So unauthorised access, it might be that only, the, only someone has got access. It's quite narrow and it's quite contained. That may make a difference. <laughs> Often depends on the nature of the sensitivity or the volume of the data. These are factors to, think into, to take into account. The ease of identification of the individuals whose data is the subject of the breach. Um, consequences is a massive, massive consideration. What are the likely consequences for the affected individuals? Uh, if there are, if there is child, children's data or vulnerable groups data involved, that is something that we point to to being a reportable breach. Any um, numbers, of, the numbers of affected individuals, or any specific um, characteristics of the controller, so health services, stuff like that, may all may all point in different ways. I'm going to do just very limited audience participation, and I'm just going to ask people to put their hands up. So, and I would preface this by saying I don't think there is an absolute right or wrong answer to this, and it is very fact fact uh, dependent, and there isn't a lot of facts on these case studies. But I'm interested just to get a straw poll as to whether people think these things are reportable or not. So in this case, it's an HR situation where. A, where personal data relating to an unsuccessful job applicant is accidentally sent to the successful applicant. And the successful applicant says, it's fine, I've deleted it. Do we think? It does depend slightly on what the data is. Would we be thinking we would report that? Hands up if you think you would. A few. I think the, the majority say, no, or not put my hand up. <laughs> Let's try to. A GP accidentally encloses the wrong patient's medical records and puts it in a referral letter to a consultant. The letter sent by ordinary post, and that's in breach of the practice policy. What do we think? Assume the, con the consultant gets it. Would you report it? More people think, yep. Yeah. Okay. And the last one, customer tells you that logged on to your website and they saw information relating to another customer, but you investigate and it appears to have been pretty much an isolated error and you've patched it, it's fixed, it's, it's not, it, nothing has happened. Would you report? Some? Some? It's quite interesting because I think in most cases the majority lies with either I'm, I'm not reporting or I'm not putting my hand up. <laughs> so... Uh, but it, I, again, I would stress that I, I think in probably most of these, I would probably err towards not, but I think, and that was broadly, I think, the consensus. So, interesting. Joint controllership. Um, Martin talked about this very briefly last time round, um, and we mentioned the facts behind two cases. Um, I'm not going to spend much time talking about the actual cases themselves, except for those who weren't there last time, just to give you enough context for what I'm about to say. So the two decisions came out in June of this year from the European Court of Justice, both under the, the 1995 directive. So this is pre-GDPR, but the underlying law isn't much changed under GDPR. So I think what the Court of Justice was saying is likely to be equally relevant to, to the GDPR world in which we live now. So two decisions. One is about Facebook, and this was about a Facebook fan page. And the issue was whether or not the administrator, the person who'd set the, the Facebook fan page up, was actually a controller or a processor of the data that was being processed by Facebook, by people who came onto the Facebook fan page. And the European Court's decision was the administrator is a is a joint controller of that data with Facebook. And the, the rationale for that was that the, the creator of the fan page had influence over the parameters, the processing parameters, that were then 
being used by Facebook to process data. So because they influenced or contributed to the purposes or the manner of Facebook's processing, they would con be considered to be a joint controller. As Martin said last time round, that caused a little bit of surprise in these circles. I'll explain why in a second. Court said, though, that where there are several operators joint, jointly responsible for data. Firstly, there is no requirement for all of them to have access to the data. So the, the administrator, in the case of the Facebook fan page, didn't have access to personal data. They were getting statistical data, but because they were influencing the processing that Facebook were doing, they were considered to be a joint controller. The court also said is even though you may have joint responsibility for data, that does not necessarily mean equal responsibility. So it's much more nuanced. And I took this quote from the bottom and it said that those operators may be involved at different stages of the processing of the data and to, and to different degrees so that the level of responsibility of each of them must be assessed with regard to all of the circumstances of the particular case. Now, what I take from that is this is much more fluid than I thought. You know, it's not a binary, do we take joint decisions about data? People may be involved at different stages and therefore influence how data is processed. They may be joint controllers. Very unlikely. We, we put, and then came the Jehovah's Witnesses case, rather than say, and then came the Jehovah's Witnesses. So, but this was a case involving them. So this was door, doorstep visits. Now, what was the relationship? And in that case, um, the, the conclusion was that, firstly, the domestic purposes exemption didn't apply. I never thought it would. But the individual Jehovah's Witnesses coming to the door were data controllers. But actually, the communities that were organizing them were also controllers. So again, there was joint responsibility for that processing. And again, the court said, but well, firstly, if you've got joint responsibility for data, it doesn't mean that you, you both have, had, have to have access to that data. And again, joint responsibility does not necessarily mean equal responsibility. Looking at all of that, what does you know what does this what does this mean well the first thing i took from it is the concept of joint controllership is wider than we previously took it in the uk i think we had a con concept of controllers in common under the 1998 act and that was kind of where you had a shared pot of data people were using it for different purposes that seems to have been a uk construct rather than a european one and it doesn't appear now in GDPR or the 2018 Act. So GDPR, if you've got joint controllers, imposes specific obligations. So what it says is, and this, was, this is still the statutory test, where two or more controllers jointly determine the purposes and means of processing their joint controllers. But I think that language has to be read in conjunction with these European Court of Justice cases that suggest it's wider than the literal interpretation of, these, of th that provision. The responsibility is then for joint controllers in a transparent manner to determine their respective <coughs> responsibilities for compliance with the regulations. They, uh, the arrangements may designate a contact point for data subjects, and the arrangements must reflect the respective roles and relationships of the, the joint controllers vis-a-vis -vis the data subjects. So you need to be thinking about this in the context of who's responsible for compliance with their obligations insofar as they relate to the, the data subjects. And the essence of that arrangement has to be made available to the data subject. Now, all of that stuff we knew because it's in the, it's in the, the, the regulation. What's, what I think these cases do is potentially open the scope for when these these these, uh, this Article 26 provision may actually apply. So if you're going to have a joint controller relationship, and I think there may be more joint controller relationships around than we previously thought, then you need to allocate your responsibilities for compliance under data protection law. And I just offered up some thoughts. We've been working on this in the last couple of months in terms of producing a uh, a joint controller uh, agreement that we think is a workable thing and it can get quite complicated because you often think of joint controllers just as being two parties but it can be multiple parties. So the way that we've tried to tackle this is to try and produce a table that breaks down all the elements of GDPR and then you can allocate responsibility quite clearly 
in a kind of user-friendly place where actually with the output is something that everyone can understand and it's much easier to transmit to the people who may be dealing with the data directly. But the issues to consider, I think, are, you know, is there one common legal basis for what is going on or does each party have its own? And if the, each party has its own, you need to document that. Uh, does one party have primary responsibility for, for all of this or are all of them, you know, all of them equally responsible? And who has the relationships with the data subject? How are you making decisions about data? Are you, is it, you, does it require unanimity? Are there, are there different decision-making processes, so maybe majority decision-making? Would you have some sort of reserved set of decisions that can only be made unanimously? How is governance taking place? If you've got joint controllership, how do you, how, what are the governance arrangements to determine how you actually operate? And then importantly, how do you address liability? So if joint controllers, and one joint controller lets a side down, then how is that being how is that being dealt with? And that is about, about limitation of liability, it is about cross indemnities, all sorts of things that you need to be thought about. So really what I'm trying to do here is just flag this up as something to be aware of and there are some quite complex issues to be thought through if you are thinking about joint controllership. Brexit. Um, we're not quite sure yet how it's how it's going to, to play out. We're not quite sure if there is a deal exactly what that deal is going to involve as at March 2019 in terms of data and what, what will be swept up in transitional arrangements or what will come out as, as, a, as an end point. But the UK government has issued as part of its planning for, for a no deal Brexit has issued some thoughts and I think it's worth going through these just again so you understand where the, the current thinking is at least on this side of the channel. So um, first point is if you're simply processing data in the UK and it, your, your processing is entirely domestic then you're probably not affected. If you are processing data um, and you're transferring data to the EU, so it's one way and it's going to the EU, then there's no issue short term because the UK government has made it clear that they will not have a problem with data going to the European Union from the UK. That's fine. That's their stated position, but it is I, the reason we said in the short term is it's still a bit of a negotiation there to be had because we don't know yet what the European position is going to be. Um, but it does appear pretty clear because the European Union's stated position at the moment is that they will not, they will not um, produce an adequacy finding for the UK until it actually becomes a third, third country. So we need to be out of the EU before they'll even think about issuing an adequacy decision, which kind of possibly means that there will be a time lag around that. So that does probably raise the spectre of if you've got data and you've got data going both directions, you may then need to, if you're sharing it with people or you're using some sort of service provider, you may need to put in model form clauses to allow data to come out of the EU and over to the UK. Um, so I raise this just so that everyone understands that there may be some things to do depending on what actually comes out of these, these negotiations. We will give you an update clearly when we do the next one of these in a couple of months' time. Um, the, the other thing that's not discussed but is important is that um, you know, when we are out of the EU, we may, we may be subject to the extraterritorial provisions of GDPR, which may mean that UK companies need to appoint an EU representative under the, the third country rules under GDPR. So if you're processing, you're established outside the EU and you're processing inside, you may need to appoint an EU representative. So there are things that will need to be thought through once it becomes clearer what is actually happening. I see enforcement and data security trends. For those of you who are regular attendees at this, firstly, I salute you for coming. Um, but secondly, we, we cover this, we cover this quite, quite often because, again, even though some of the... the some of the things that come out are, are 
common. They're things that are self-evident. They do, they are worth repeating because it just data the data security incidents are reported quarterly. It's the same stuff that keep coming out. So what I wanted to do was just highlight a couple of the the recent large fines. They are fines that were levied before GDPR, but again. I suspect that there will be fines, there would probably just be larger fines under GDPR. Um, first one is uh, Emma's diary. So this was, um, this was the sale of personal data relating to one, about one million people to Experian, who then provided it to Labour Party and they then used that to send targeted emails, I think, to, uh, to, to women and children uh, in connection with the protection of uh, Sure Start Children's Centres. The point being that when individuals gave up their data to Emma's diary, there was no mention at all of this kind of use of data. And so the ICO fined uh, Emma's diary £140,000. Uh, the second one is a decision involving BUPA. Um, and in that case, member of staff extracted uh, the personal information of over half a million customers and sold it on the dark web. And the thing that the ICO took action about, the thing that where you know we talked earlier about Morrison's, on the face of it, they didn't fail in their obligations under the DPA. The difference here is that this case, Bupa did. Um, the employee was able to sell, send bulk reports to a personal email account. So they were sending, you know, huge, huge files of, of um, uh, customer data to Gmail accounts, etc. And th that's what the ICO said was the breach. So in that case, Bupa was fined £175,000. And the final, the final, um, final example is Heathrow Airport. Uh, earlier this month, find £120,000. Um, There's a lost USB stick containing unencrypted information relating to staff, picked up by someone, took it home, read it, had a look at it, then gave it to a national newspaper, then the national newspaper handed it into the ICO. Um, the thing there, and again, these are, these are obvious things, but the thing that the ICO picked up, a couple of things particularly, only 2% of staff had received data protection training. So, you know, the value of education is, is, is paramount. And they had ineffective controls on removable uh, media. And they, but they had policies, they just were not enforcing them. So the practices were carrying on, even though the policies were in place to stop it happening. So again, you've got to walk the walk and not just talk the talk. At this point, we normally have the ICO graphics that explain you know, what the security trends are for the last quarter. Um, the ICO didn't publish the, the quarter one trends um, anywhere near as quickly as they normally do, I think, because it probably had other things to do. There's a lot going on. Um, so we don't have the, the snappy, snappy graphics. We've got a very scrappy Excel spreadsheet. Um, I think there's just a couple of things that I would, I would pick out. Um, Health was the, was the sector that seemed to be most affected, followed by general business and education. 66% of incidents related to unintended disclosure. And again, you know, when you look back at kind of the Heathrow stuff, that, that is, is my experience. A lot of it is still around, and I think these figures, although we don't have the underlying incidents, I think a lot of it will still be around emailing data to the wrong people, sending things out to the wrong address, mixing things up. These are perennial problems, and these are the things that have been problems throughout data protection, but will become even more important under GDPR. In terms of IT security, I think the things that I took from this is the most reports in quarter one around IT security were in terms of phishing, so phishing attacks. And I think it is important to, to make sure that staff really understand that there are a lot of emails going out around at the moment that look as if they're official, they are designed to lull people into actually clicking on a link and actually opening them up. And actually they can cause 
a lot of a lot of problems and often reportable <coughs> incidents. So again, something to to have on your agenda. Um, and this is all pre-GDPR data, but it is equally important for a GDPR world. What's on the horizon? Well, I think there are there's quite a lot still to come, and, and <laughs> I think if we looked at this slide in June, I think most of the same things that are on this list um, were there then. So actually, there's a lot of stuff in the pipeline. It is taking longer, I think, to come through than we expected, although there have been some consultations, there have been some requests for, for views, etc. So, you know, the ICO has an obligation to issue codes of practice under the New Data Protection Act. I think we're all very interested to see, you know, the new direct marketing code, um, the data sharing code, there was a call for evidence which closed last month. Um, we are expecting an, an age-appropriate design code, so this is for, for processing that relates to, to children, and, and this is for apps and stuff like that. So much more, I think we expect much more emphasis on things like graphics, pictures, you know, cartoon-type characters to make um, privacy statements or, or the information that is required to be given to, to, to data subjects much, much more appealable or much more appealing, sorry, to, to, to children. So if you are involved in areas where you are collecting data from children, this is something that you really need to be looking out for because it will be important. Uh, and we also expect a, a, a code for journalism as well. So there is quite a lot of stuff there is quite a lot of stuff we are expecting to come out from the ICO. We are hoping to get a final draft of the e-privacy regulation. Mind you, the expectation when this was originally published was that the e-privacy regulation would be on the statute book and in force at the same time as GDPR. Clearly, that is not the case. Um, there are, there, it just seems to be taking an awful lot longer to get through the European institutions than, than was expected. Now, this is particularly, this is, this is relevant to e-marketing, particularly those relying on soft opt-in. The soft opt-in provisions are in there. So, you know, the future of soft opt-in will um, lie very much in terms of the privacy regulation. Also, things like cookies and, and you know, the, the, the provisions relating to, to browsers, et cetera, all of that is wrapped up in the e-privacy regulation. So, that's something definitely we will be keeping an eye out. And of course, you don't just wait for these events to tell you about them. You know, we do publish things, look at our blogs and, and the website. Um, Schrems 2, for those of you who are familiar with Max Schrems, Max Schrems was, or not familiar with Max Schrems, Max Schrems is the privacy campaigner who originally brought down Safe Harbor a few years back. Um, he is having a go at various other things, uh, particularly Privacy Shield. He's particularly unhappy with Privacy Shield. And as I explained earlier, right at the start of this, there are a number of people on the European side not happy with Privacy Shield, particularly under the current US administration. Uh, but there is also an ongoing challenge to the European courts via Ireland uh, in the context of Facebook as to whether or not the standard uh, contractual clauses, so the model form clause mechanism to allow data to be exported outside the EEA actually is valid. So um, now the expectation is that that decision is still some while away. At the moment you'll be aware that under GDPR the model form clauses is a, is a device that was created under the 1995 directive. It is preserved under GDPR at the moment so we're still using model form clauses to justify the export of data outside the EEA. But that mechanism is under challenge. And the European Commission have not issued you know, a GDPR version of the model form clauses, I suspect in part, because they want to let this litigation involving Max Schrems run its course or at least a bit further to understand what the European Court's view is on the current contractual model in order that it can produce a model that is not going to be struck down through Schrems 3 or Schrems 4. So that's again something, and that if, if the, the model form clauses are struck down, that is going to cause an awful lot of pain to an awful lot of organisations who use them quite heavily. So again, something to watch. Um, Brexit, 
Um, I mentioned earlier what the issues are. Clearly, we will come to we will come to a landing on that at some point in the coming months, and we will be very much watching what the out outcome of that is for data protection and our relationship with the EU and data transfers both ways. And I think by the end of the year, we are expecting the first kind of fines to start coming out under GDPR. And there are, you know, there have been a number of quite high, fo high profile data breaches in the last few months, you know, where I would expect, I'm not privy to the background, but if there have been breaches of legislation, I would expect there to be some substantial fines being landed. So this whole issue of, you know, whether or not the, you know, the maximum fines, you know, are ever going to be come into to play, I don't think we'll see any of those immediately, but we'll start getting a sense for what the regulators are starting to think in their mind as they're opening gambit in terms of fines for significant data breaches. You know, and there, are, there have been a number. So I think we'll start getting flesh on the bones as to what that might look like. And of course, they will make headlines because they will, I imagine, be well above the half a million limit which we've had under the 1998 Act. So there was a lot to cover. I tried to, I tried to give it all justice. Um, there will be a lot coming through in the next couple of months. So if you are involved in this area, do keep what, do keep an eye out for what we're saying, because there will be quite a lot of significant stuff. Um, I'm conscious we're, we're in good time, it's about quarter to ten, so time for questions if anybody would like to.